we're going to move on to our next panel and discussion that will be led by Professor Adam Davis. He's the department head of crop sciences here at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign College of ACES. His research includes data mining and allowing farmers to get more yields. He also has a lot of work in climate change and sustainability. His department used to be the Department of Agronomy. In fact, it's the oldest agronomy department in the United States. It was founded back in the 1800s, but it's still a nationally ranked plant sciences department with a rich history and strong academic reputation. It also is home to the longest continuously farmed experimental plots. So many of you who've been to the University of Illinois may have walked past those moral plots. And today it's a pioneer in new types of innovation in agriculture, including the nation's first computer science and crop sciences degree program. Welcome, Professor Davis. Thanks very much, Laura. Um, I'm really excited to host this panel today and to have uh, Matt Duncan and Tom Rabay joining us. Um, Matt is manager of digital agronomy at Nutrien Ag Solutions, and Tom is senior research and development manager at General Mills. So many of you may have heard about regenerative agriculture. Um, it's become a buzzword in the popular press. And I'd like to take a moment to unpack it before we get into the panel proper. So regenerative ag is an outcome oriented metric driven approach uh, to moving the needle and balancing productivity, profitability and sustainability across multiple performance dimensions for ag systems. Some of the key outcomes we're striving for in regenerative ag include improving soil health, biodiversity, and resilience of agricultural and food systems. One thing that I really like about RA is that by taking an outcome rather than a practice-oriented approach, the goal of the movement is to pitch a big tent and invite many players to contribute to improvements in food and ag systems from where they are. Um, I'm also pleased to announce that the Illinois Regenerative Agriculture Initiative was launched this fall, uh, funded by Fresh Taste, and with the goal of bringing together University of Illinois personnel and actors in the regenerative ag space to make progress together. As part of this regenerative ag initiative, we welcomed Dr. Emily Heaton to our department as our first professor of regenerative ag. And we will be having a session on April 9th to discuss uh, and uh, launch the RFP for the Regenerative Ag Initiative that will bring together Illinois uh, faculty and RA uh, stakeholders. So Matt and Tom, you represent organizations from different ends of the value chain. Nutrient Ag Solutions is focused on the production end of things whereas General Mills is mostly at the consumer end. Um, Matt, could you describe what regenerative ag means to you from the perspective of where your organization sits in the agricultural value chain? Yeah, I th yeah thank you, uh, Dr. Davis. Uh, I think you had a good, uh, good introduction in that uh, the way you described it with outcomes-based uh, is something that we, we very much believe in as well. Um, you know, Nutrient Ag Solutions, we're an ag retailer service provider. Um, and so, you know, we believe that it's really important that as an industry as a whole, that regenerative ag isn't defined by like a specific practice, you know, but rather it's a science-based and outcomes focused. And, you know, the way I say it, you know, agriculture has always learned how to improve farming practices through observing outcomes. You know, what did we do this year? What did that turn into? What kind of outcome do we get from all those combined practices and combining that with the weather influence and those types of things? And this continuum of adjusting practices based on a desired versus observed outcomes, it, it continues today. And, you know, we feel that regenerative agriculture really needs to include three kind of big components of sustainable ag, which is it needs to be sustainable from an environmental perspective. From a production level, how much food and fiber are we producing? Does it meet the demands of, of the world? And from an economic perspective, and you know, the economics is complex as well, right? It goes for it's got to be economical for the consumer, for the farmer, and for everyone else involved in that in that supply chain. So, yeah, I think that key outcomes for both sustainable and regenerative ag have to include looking at soil health, soil water, and air quality. Um, you know, in a way that 
improves production efficiency and farm income as well. So we think implemented broadly, the ag industry can really be a pretty significant part of the solution to climate change mitigation. And I think that the key is finding that combination of practices that's going to help that, the farmer meet those regenerative ag goals. And I think the other, one of the other things that, that we kind of talk about sometimes internally is, you know, there, there really is no one size fits all magic combination of practices that's going to achieve the needed outcomes for each and every farm. It's going to take a more site specific approach. Uh, we need to identify which combinations of practices and, and uh, influences of environment and soils and things, you know, which combinations of those practices in those specific geographies will help to move each field, each farm, and, and the entire industry along that continuum of improved agriculture. Great. Thank you, Matt. And Tom, from the consumer end of the ag value chain, could you describe what RA means to you um, from your organization? Yes, certainly. And I, I also uh, I like the, uh, the, the, the approach that you started with Dr. Davison as well. Uh, Matt, about that regenerative ag is a, is a broad tent. It's large and it's all encompassing of, of different practices and principles, and we support that. I think from a consumer standpoint, for like General Mills of consumers are eating our cereal or eating granola bars or whatever it might be, you know, consumers may not think or know or, or quite understand, you know, the, the importance of you know, soil health or is, you know, what's the nutrient balance in the soil or what, the, you know, is, you know, carbon being stored or not, or, you know, kind of a lot of those mechanistic um, processes that take place within soil health or regenerative ag, but consumers do indeed understand or think about or reach out to us on, you know, how their food is grown, where it's grown, is it grown sustainably, you know, what were the practices, um, they, they do understand that biodiversity, insect biodiversity is, is potentially declining, they do understand the importance and need for pollinators and monarch butterflies and, and bees and native bees to that extent, and where is water, water quality clean and and uh, surface waters for drinking and municipalities or farm, you know, rural wells, that type of thing. And so, that type, that's how that connection is, comes through to us and back to, to farm. And so what we're, you know, most interested in is really supporting, you know, farmers and uh, being enablers. We're, our job is not developing checklists and, you know, trying to implement rules and regulations and, and change that way. How we're really going about it is working with, you know, trusted advisors or potential ingredient suppliers that supply to us ingredients or grains or, you know, milled grain to that extent, you know, to go and to work with farmers on practices or principles that do indeed, you know, change or improve or, or move the dial in a sense that, you know, are you, you know, no-till, that these are principles, you know, you know no-till or cover crops or what that might be, but then to measure those outcomes that consumers are most interested in, you know, such as improvements to, you know, biodiversity or water quality over time, farmer economic resilience. We talk about that a, long, a lot as well within our company because farmer economic resilience is important to resilient supply chains. And as we've heard from previous speakers, you know, we needed a lot more grain this past year because we were, um, you know, selling more products uh, in store as consumers ate at home. And so we need growers to stay in business. We need grain handlers and grain millers to stay in business long term and to be able to source the ingredients they need to supply us and we feel that regenerative agriculture can can do all that help with consumers help with consumer supply chains resilience the economic resiliency that Matt alluded to for the long term. Great thanks Tom. So we're at an ag tech summit. Can you tell us, Tom, how existing and emerging technologies will help your organization to engage in the regenerative ag movement and which outcomes your organization is particularly focused on? It's a great question. And so in my area that I work with in, in, in uh, General Mills, we're the, we're the agriculture research group and we have you know, soil scientists and biologists that are working on new technology to measure those outcomes of regenerative ag and obviously we can't do that all internally so we're working with you know universities and nrcs and you know you name it other upstarts um, to to measure those outcomes 
you know, in the past, we could send, um, we can send someone out with a sweep net and go look for biodiversity on the edge of a field or in a field. But we know that if we really want to, you know, make meaningful change across supply regions, across areas we source oats or wheat or, or other ingredients from, we have to be able to do that with new technology. And that can be different, uh, you know, monitoring uh, technology. It can be used, done through, you know, satellite imagery, using satellite imagery to evaluate, you know, the amount of cover crops were planted or the amount of, uh, you know, tillage that maybe occurred in an area. What were the crops that were grown? What was the rotations? You know, these other practices that are important to regenerative agriculture. Uh, that, that is an example, you know, and then kind of using models or AI to help us make those predictions that we are, you know, so if we're working within a region and we're trying to make improvements over time, you know, has, has uh, you know, cover crop adoption in, improved? Has, do we know that carbon sequestration is taking place? How are we going to measure carbon sequestration at scale if, if growers want to participate within carbon markets uh, for the long term? So those are, those are areas that we're investing technology in as well. So for us, the big, big area is the technology around measurement and measurement at scale, whether it's biodiversity, water quality, carbon in the soil, in, in those areas. Thanks, Tom. And Matt, same question, but now from the input side of things and, and uh, production management side of things at Nutrient. Yeah, so you know, I think uh, Tom Tom's actually leads pretty nicely into ours. You know, we do have a um, a platform for uh, farmers to enter their information uh, to collect that data to quantify practices and 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 the effects of those practices over time. You know, as far as the areas we're focused on, um, we have include, well, first of all, <laughs> for Nutrien, you know, we've included sustainability in our ESG report, which ESG stands for Environment, Social, and Corporate Governance. So it means that sustainability is an integral part of our business now and, and therefore has to be part of our behavior. And so as we move forward with that, we are actively working both internally and in partnership with other organizations um, on multiple projects, uh, some that involve carbon sequestration. Um, so monitoring and, and changing of practices to, to monitor effects over time that can lead to payments for farmers, uh, as well as nitrogen management programs. And, you know, looking at, you know, maybe as an example, a reduced rate to, you know, try to maintain yields while making the use efficiency better uh, type of thing. Um, and so we see technology as well as data science as, as really critical components to achieving sustainability and regenerative goals at scale. Uh, I don't, don't see how it's gonna work at scale without the use of technology broadly. And you know, we're using a wide range of technologies, kind of like Tom mentioned as well, you know, everything from you know, your, 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 what most in the ag are used to for soil sampling and laboratory type analyses to imagery from various sources, sensors, mobile applications, um, you know, weather analytics uh, is a big thing that we, we have in, as part of our group, um, you know, cloud computing and uh, you know, computational modeling. I think modeling will be a pretty important key piece of this. As Tom mentioned, uh, it's, it's pretty hard to measure everything uh, directly. So modeling in conjunction with measurements is gonna be pretty important to, uh, to build regenerative ag practices and quantify their benefit at scale. Great, yeah, so you've mentioned a wide range of existing technologies. What technologies don't yet exist, Matt, that would be beneficial in your view for achieving regenerative ag outcomes? Well, we're still working on that full year forecast that's accurate to the day all year long, right? Um, weather, weather forecasting, I think, is a really key component that, um, you know, right now, I think for weather, it's about 10 days out. It's about as far as, as any, any current system is, is accurately able to predict. And, you know, for regenerative, you look at, um, you know, so carbon sequestration, gains, losses, uh, nitrogen, movement and the nitrogen cycle, all of it revolves around weather, and moisture, temperature, and, and that kind of the microclimates in the soil. And so I really think that there's, there needs to be further development from the, the weather analytics component of things uh, to really help both the modeling as well as the expectations and, and understanding of how, what actually caused practices to work to the degree they did or didn't. Um, you know, and I think there's there's a lot of sensor technology still to come. Uh, probably one of the biggest things that biggest benefits in, in the last decade or so has been 
you know, cloud computing and, and the, the minimal cost and ease at which people can now do massive computations. Uh, you know, compared to a couple of decades ago, that was incredibly expensive and really slow. And, and those limitations are gone now. Uh, and that's going to continue to improve. Great. Uh, Tom, same question. What technologies don't yet exist, but you, would you like to see in order to achieve regenerative ag outcomes? Yeah. I think there's there's two areas that come to mind. It, one is as you know, as one of the the areas that we'd like to measure uh, outcomes in, and that's in the biodiversity, uh, insect, pollinator, uh, bird biodiversity within cropping systems where we buy oats or wheat from. So really, the northern plains or the you know more of the western plains region and. There's really, um, again, not a, not any. We need um, we need sensors. We need some tools that can help help with that. We need to be able to do that at scale. That's uh, that's economically economical at scale. So much of that activity takes, uh, you know, requires a person to go out in person. Now, there's been some developments of you know listening devices or using, you know, camera imaging to to help with that. But there's some some work that needs to be there done there. I think the biggest area though, and Matt hit on that as well too, is kind of this whole carbon accounting. There's a there's a real push and a lot of work being done in this whole um, you know, uh, you know, carbon credit, carbon trading work right now with that could would be an outcome of regenerative agriculture. And right now it requires a lot of baseline soil sampling for farmers that maybe want to participate in some pilots. You know, there's both public and uh, there's a, there's several private companies that are that are working on this together as well. And then there's the ecosystem service market, the consortium that's underway as well that uh, General Mills is a member of, and I think others as well on this call are too. Um, you know, how do we measure at scale? How do we how do we demonstrate that if growers are implementing practices such as cover crops and no-till and whatever else it, that may be, that we are getting the carbon into the soil? Uh, the the cost to measure that I mean by time you get the measurement done and you have the credits available there's really nothing left for the <laughs> for the farmer per se you know in this existing you know model so we need to be able to measure carbon at scale easily through modeling through AI through sensors um, that can help with these these markets. Yeah, I think Tom, that's a great point. That is something that you know we're actively working on. I'm sure others are as well. But but yeah, that trying to balance the, the need for actual physical data and the need to get to scale with the current price of a carbon credit or the range of price for carbon credits uh, is, is a really kind of a tightrope walk right now. And I think you're absolutely correct that, you know, there, we, we have some ways to go in the industry on making the, that data acquisition side of the, the physical measurements um, more economical at scale. Terrific. So we've got a bunch of questions in the Q&A in the chat. So um, let's see. Uh, the conversation, this is from Austin Rupke. The conversation has been around the carbon credits for farmers to incentivize cover crops and sequestration. However, one of the largest expenditures of carbon is creating ammonia through the Haber-Bosch process. Question, has carbon reduction of input creation been evaluated for net carbon cost of agriculture? Do uh, you want to try that one, Matt? I can start. Um, yeah, that's, that's a pretty complex question. But yeah, I mean, there is there is a carbon cost to anything that's done on the farm, right? Whether it's a, a, a planter pass or a, a, a uh, input pass, uh, nitrogen uh, is, is a big one because, you know, nitrogen has a pretty ugly multiplier and it's a uh, CO2 equivalent if it gets into the atmosphere. Um, and then there's the cost to produce to or the carbon cost of making the products. Um, I will say that, you know, I know there's some new research out there that's, that's looking at ways to uh, make the nitrogen at a much lower energy input, which would reduce that cost significantly. And uh, like from, for Nutrien's case, we do have some uh, carbon-based fertilizer products, car carbon-based products that, that are, are meant to uh, reduce that footprint while still supplying the plant with what it needs. So there's a lot of technologies that are, that are in the works uh, being researched, uh, some that are developed. Uh, you know, I think the, some of the biologicals will be an important key to this as well. You know, ways to make the nutrients available to the plants uh, with, that, with less um, 
commercial inputs uh, from, you know, say an anhydrous type of source. A question from Mark in the Q&A, wondering how drying costs are being addressed in your company. Drying is large input cost uh, in both grain drying and food processing. What is being addressed at your companies? Tom, you want to start there? That's a good, that's a good question. Um, grain drying on farm. You know, I don't have a perfect answer for that. That's a little bit outside of uh, the scope that we're working in with right now, as far as regenerative ag goes, I think too, as you know, as a, as a, our, our portfolio primarily centers around oat and wheat production, um, less so for corn and, and soy. So um, less drying is, is, is um, you know, in fact, little to no drying of oats in the Northern Plains and probably less in, in wheat as well. I would, um, I would say from like a food processing standpoint, how we view this, we know as a company that internally our, our as a company, our facilities, our processing facilities themselves and the energy consumption, I think if I recall, I mean, that's like 11% of our footprint and that, uh, but our agriculture ingredients as a food company, our ingredient footprint that what we buy sugar, whether it comes from sugar beets or cane or, you know, fats and oils from soy or, or you know, sunflower oil, canola oil, whatever it may be, almost, you know, 50 some percent of that foot of our company's footprint resides in those ingredients that we buy. And so that's why we, we've been focusing and placing effort against um, you know, regenerative agriculture, going back to the farm and to work with, with farmers on that, that footprint uh, that's associated with those ingredients. And again, as we started off, our role or job is not to create, you know, checklists and rules and, uh, you know, you know, to make it more difficult to farm. What really, really want to do is enable practices that help farmers meet those goals of carbon sequestra sequestration, uh, you know, supply chain resilience, as I mentioned earlier, and really work with trusted supply, uh, uh, partners, trusted partner agronomists that can help those growers make that transition. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, the drying cost is a challenging one because, you know, the, the weather patterns you had for the year will affect what you end up with, for, you know, how, how wet that grain may or may not be uh, by the end of the season. Um, you know, I think something that, that farmers can look at and, and work with their crop advisors on is, you know, uh, selection of, of products, you know, for your geography, you know, if, if drying is an expensive thing to do, if it has to be done, both from a cash perspective, as well as a, a carbon cost perspective, um, you know, and so, but there is some product selections that can be done for um, seed products that are, are better at dry down, you know, late season dry down while maintaining, let's say for corn, you know, stock strength. And so it's, you know, an ear retention, you know, so you don't lose the harvest, but you do lose the moisture. Um, but yeah, that is, that is a, a big component that I don't know that there's too many people specifically working on that as they, as they, their core problem to solve. Um, but it is something that can be managed at least, uh, with some, some practice adjustments. Yeah. It, it, it's an interesting question too, as you were talking about, I had a chance to think a little bit more. And one of the things about regenerative agriculture too, is it's kind of this holistic, you know, mindset, mind shift. And, and really what it maybe is a little bit too, is thinking about, profitability from on the farm, you know, in that holistic fashion. And to Matt's point, you know, looking at, okay, optimizing yield of corn on the front end of one thing, but not necessarily taking into account what happens after in the next step per se, drying costs or, or, or associated costs and environmental, you know, costs associated with that drying costs. And I think some growers are thinking or looking to, to that to that point is like, what is the holistic uh, approach to the farm? Everything from the fertilizer I buy at the start of the year to the crop I'm going to grow to those drying and transportation costs at the end of the day. And just looking at, you know, how does that all balance out? And again, I'm not an economist as a research agronomist. It's a little bit out of my scope, but that, that's somewhat what I'm hearing as well with growers that have really kind of adopted some of these regenerative practices overall on their farm. Yeah, Tom, and that's a good point. I mean, I think, you know, with, you know, our nutrients perspective is, you know, we look at things from a solutions perspective versus an individual product um, view for that exact reason, you know, so base it on the whole picture of practices. What's the, what's the net effect of those practices and, and what does that do to get you to the outcome you're looking for? Um, because yeah, you're right. If, if we approach every, if we approach regenerative ag or, or ag in general as, you know, a, one one input at a time, we we miss that big picture entirely, uh, which is not 
going to lend itself to efficiency and improvements over time. So we are basically at time here. We're at 10.54, I believe. Uh, we finished at 10.55. Do you have a 30-second soundbite um, for finishing up, Tom? Anything you want to say? I think it's a big tent. I mean, as a company, we also have organic brands and we have organic growers that participate in our Regen Egg pilots. I think that there's many solutions out there. And I think looking at environmental improvement outcomes over time is, is really the key to, to gain widespread acceptance. Matt, you want to add your two cents here? Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, um, groups like ours, and I, I'm sure there's others in, in retail as well as supplier chain and, and, you know, consumer goods products companies. I mean, we're, we're we've staffed up significantly. Um, we have a sustainability department, digital agronomy, and computational sciences group. Um, that includes, you know, atmospheric scientists and, and um, soil scientists and things like that. And, you know, what we're really working to do is, is one, help, help make it easier for the farmers that we work with to find programs, to adopt practices, um, and, and enable some of that ease and efficiency through digital tools. And, um, you know, I think the goal is we're trying to build a better system, you know, to help uh, identify and predict, you know, which combinations of practices with all the other variables out there affecting the outcomes and which combinations of those things produce the most desired regenerative outcome. And if we can, as we build that, we will become more and more consistent at making the best selections year after year. So thank you very much for joining us, Tom and Matt. Um, we'll be taking care of some of the Q&A uh, answers uh, offline and uh, I'll hand it over to you, Laura. Sounds good. Thank you so okay. much, Tom from General Mills, Matt from Nutrien. Thanks mm -hmm. to Nutrien for being a part of our research park and having purchased one of our startup companies, Agribowl, and continuing to grow in Champaign County. Um, Professor Davis, as he said, will help to address some of these questions. And I just would like to remind the audience that we will have a separate session on carbon credits. Since there were a lot of questions in that area, I look forward to that.